Welcome to Collecting Chaos. It's the Monday Morning Show. As you can see, I zoomed in a little bit, and I did that because I want to talk about dice. Um, I mean, this show is basically about Dungeons and Dragons, and this is part three. Part three? Yeah, there it is. Part three. Um, and without dice, you don't have Dungeons and Dragons, really. Uh, you need some type of random number generator. And uh, I want to show you this four-sided dice I have. This is an original four-sided die that I got with the original three book set, three pamphlet set, I should say, Men in Magic, Monsters and Treasures, and Underworld Adventures. This is what I, I have more somewhere. This is the only one I could find. This one, this is a 10 sided die and this came with the uh, Dungeons and Dragons basic set. And as you can see, it's pretty crude. Both of these came with crayons so that you could color it in. You know, you, you put a crayon in there and it would stick inside of the recessed area. Then you wipe it off and you can see the... the I never used those. This is an original 30-sided die. Now, it's got plus four... Uh, well, like, here, zero plus zero, and somewhere I have, and minus zero. And, uh, you know, the minus zero was one, zero to one, or one to ten. The uh, regular zero was eleven to twenty, and the plus was twenty-one to thirty. So, uh, that's three types of die. This is a later thirty-sided die, and it, you know, numbered zero to thirty. Here's an interesting six-sided die that you probably have never seen before. It's kind of a weird oblong thing. It doesn't really roll. So, and of course we have six-sided dice. Different sizes, different shapes, it doesn't matter. Different colors, it doesn't matter. Uh, I have two of these. One of these goes to a set. I think it's this one that goes to the set. And uh, in that set, I got a four-sided, a six-sided, an eight-sided, a ten-sided, twelve-sided, and a twenty-sided die. And this is the typical set. They would come in a tube, and uh, this was typical. And sometimes you'd get them, and they'd have three six-sided die in the tube. But this one is uh, this one is smaller than that, so I know this isn't part of the set. So uh, this is an older eight-sided die that I bought. I think this came out of another game, and I don't remember which game it was. Uh, but it used it used eight-sided dice. And then I have some miscellaneous. There's another four-sided, another eight, a 20 with something nasty on it. I'll have to, I, I'm going to wash all of these so it doesn't really matter. Uh, this is an interesting looking red. This came out of a game. And there's another eight-sided die, another green eight-sided die. Uh, but the only ones we're really going to concern ourselves with today are the standard six-sided dice. Okay, uh, because let's zoom out a little bit. What we're going to do today is I'm going to show you how they made characters in the original Dungeons and Dragons. You would take your pen, which I seem to be lacking, but I can solve that problem real quick because I have a pencil. So you take strength, and we're going to go strength, intelligence, wisdom, 
dexterity, constitution, and charisma. And uh, that's how most people would do it. And of course you can't see that very well. It'd be better if it was in ink, but that's all right. And what they would do is we would take dice, roll them. We have there a seven. So a seven strength, a little bit below average. Average is nine. There you go. There's a nine intelligence. And people just wished they would get something good. There you go. That's pretty good. That's a twelve. That's a sixteen. A nine. A fourteen. And a thirteen. This character would be a cleric. Because the wisdom is the high score. And that's what you did it. You, you played what you got. In later years... They would add an additional die. You would have four dice and roll the highest three and you'd, you'd roll them and be able to place them where you wanted. So let's do that. But we're going to do it the same way. Uh, we take away the two and we have a 14. So now we have a 14 in strength. Do it again. There's 12 Another 14, you take away the 1. Oh, that's not good. <laughs> we get a 9 for Wisdom. Obviously not a Cleric. Could be though. 9 is average, so still could be a Cleric. There's a 16. The makings of a pretty decent most anything. There's a 17th constitution, which is incredibly good. I took away the, the low one, it was a four. And an 11. We do not have a pallet in here. Uh, this could be a thief, it could be a fighter, it could be a magic user. Be pretty much anything you wanted. And that's the basics uh, on how to create the stats. Uh, in later games they would change it up and they'd do other things. Uh, my favorite way of doing it was for people decide what type of character you want. Let's say they wanted a uh, say they wanted a fighter and you roll you roll your dice uh, there we have a 13, so you just set that up here. We've got another 13. We've got a 14. Dice gods are not with me. There's an 11. Anybody that plays Dungeons and Dragons understands what I meant by the dice gods. There you go. There's a 15. One more. A 17. So if you wanted to play a, a fighter, most likely he would put the 15 under strength. Or no, wait. The 17 under strength. Next highest was 15. He'd put that under Constitution. Uh, dexterity, because that'll help them dodge. And the others, it doesn't really matter. Uh, say 13 Charisma, 13 Wisdom, and an 11 Intelligence. But that's how you would make, I mean, that's how most people make fighters. Or towards the end of AD&D 2nd uh, Edition, that's the way people would do it.
from there you flesh out the character, maybe give them a little background story or whatever you wanted to do, or the DM would give you a background story. I always liked it better if the DM gave a background story. Uh, I also used to go one step further and I did something other people didn't do. If you look in the Monstrous Manual or the Monster Manual or any of the other manuals that have to do with monsters, it gives stats for dice rolls for monsters or creatures or whatever. A human generally uh, either got a six or an eight-sided die depending on what uh, edition you were looking in. Same with the dwarf, same with, with the... Uh, uh, I mean, all of them would have a basic die roll. And that's what I started people out with. Uh, you know, you have a zero level character that wants to be an adventurer. How many, how many hit points does he have? I'd give him eight, six, four, whatever. It depended on the, on the uh, character's uh, race. Because race had its own modifiers to these statistics. Uh, an elf would be higher in dexterity. A dwarf would be higher in constitution. Human got no bonuses at all. A halfling, I think, had a higher dexterity. Uh, because, you know, halflings are thieves, according to uh, the Hobbit. Uh, <laughs> and and that's, that's pretty much the way that went. So... Maybe maybe the elf got a higher intelligence. I forget. It, it's been a long time. Uh, I'd have to dig out one of the books and show you. And I'm trying to do this without going through the books. Because I don't want to have it specific to one particular game system. When I start talking about actually making dungeons. Or making adventures. I want to... Uh, have it generic enough that you can take what I try to teach you here and apply it to any game system. So why are, why is this num why why is it important to understand all of this? Why is it important to understand what the characteristics of them are? Well, it makes a difference in dungeons and dungeon design. You have different types of characters. You have basically you have a fighter. I'm going to go get a pen so you can see what I'm writing down. Okay, I'm back. So, basically you would have a fighter. You would have, and we will zoom in a little bit so you can see even better. Yes, we are zooming in whether you like it or not. You would have a mage or a magic user. You would have a cleric, a thief, and uh, that's the four basics. Uh, if you have those four in any combination, chances are you can you can uh, go through any dungeon. This is often called a rogue. Sometimes this will be called a sorcerer. Uh, this might be called a healer. And all of these can do damage. Close up damage. So, for those of you that are gamers in the modern world, it's a tank, <laughs> healer, uh, range, range attack, and close up slash range. Uh, can a fighter be a ranged attack? Yes, a fighter could have a bow. Uh, uh, ranger, which is or ranger or hunter, is actually a subclass of fighter. And that's often used as well. Uh, and, and a lot of people make a differentiation. They'll say, well, you have a, a, a hunter ranger 
no, that's that's a ranged attack. He, he never he never does close combat. Well, he's still a fighter, basically. He's still a fighter. Uh, but they say no, it's not a fighter. It's a it's a, cl it's a ranged attack. Fighters are close combat. No, not necessarily. Not necessarily. Uh, but you have four basic types, uh, four four basic classes, and obviously your best. Uh, I mean, you can leave thief out. So you want at least three players, with four or five being optimal, in my opinion. You can have more than that. I've run, I've run uh, campaigns with seven and eight players before. It's a lengthy process, especially when you get into combat. Um, three to five, optimal in my opinion. So why is this important? Well, anytime you make an adventure and you have three basic types of adventures, as I mentioned, you have above, ground, have city, and city doesn't mean uh, millions of people. Uh, city can be a village, can be a town. It can be uh, four or five huts together. That's still a city, you know. If it's a built up area where you have people living together, consider it a city. Then you have below ground, which is the classic dungeon. And you can have any a combination of these in one particular adventure. You can have people above ground in the wilderness, they go to a city, they end up uh, getting, going into the sewers for whatever, and that's below ground, you know, so you can have a combination of all three. You can have them start in a city, go through a, a wilderness area to get to a below ground area or a dungeon. So, The primary thing to think about when you're creating a, a, an adventure, everybody needs something to do. Everybody needs some type of reward. It might not, it might be something minor. Maybe the cleric finds a rare herb. Maybe the thief managed to pick the pocket and get a diamond, a small diamond that's worth, you know, a little bit extra money. The fighter, maybe he finds a dagger or a knife or something that, that he can use that's, that's uh, a little bit better than quality than what he has, or he might find a little piece of armor that he can use. Uh, or he might beat a foe that he's never been able to beat before and therefore advance his level. But Everybody, every adventurer, and you should know what type of what adventures you have before you start, needs to have something they can find. So the best way to do it is to make sure that all of the different classes or subclasses that you might have going into this uh, adventure, all of them have something that they can gain from it. Because if you have everything, if you have the fighter, the magic user, and the cleric, but you don't have a thief, and they find thieves' picks and tools, well, they can always sell those. So they're not out by finding something that wasn't intended for them. Uh, you don't have a magic user that time, but you have a fighter, a cleric, a thief. And you find a magic scroll. Well, you can't do anything with it because none of you know what it is or how to use it, but you can always sell it and then split the profit, split the money. So it doesn't hurt to be prepared no matter what, you know, it, they find an enchanted bow. It's, you know, a plus one, minus one bow. In other words, it does plus one to hit, but it's a minus one to damage. So you're gar almost guaranteed you're going to hit the target, but you're not going to do as much damage with the arrow or the arrow breaks every time it hits the target. <laughs> you know, I've had that happen. Um, it's still a good thing to find, but if none of your people can use a bow, it's kind of useless. You might as well sell it. Uh, 
healing potions can be used by anyone, obviously, but the ability to make healing potions, that falls under cleric, and it's a subclass uh, of cleric. So, yeah, you can always find some way to use it, but you need to have, everybody needs to have something that uh, will benefit them in some way. So let's say you've made your little adventure and you have a, you have a fighter, a ranger. You have a fighter with a bow, a fighter that uses a sword or an axe, a magic user, a cleric, and you have a thief. And you come to a door and you examine the door. And the door, and, the, and, the, and they uh, determine that there's no traps on the door because they check. Uh, they determined that there's no magic on the door because they checked. And there's different ways to check that stuff. Uh, but the door's locked. Well, the fighter wants to just bust it open and just get it in there and just hit hit the lock and knock it off and go in the door. But you got a thief. Let him try. So the thief uses his skills and open and tries to open the door. See, now that is something that's targeted towards the thief. But what you might not realize is a magic user can open the locked doors too. They have a little, uh, they have a spell that's used for unlocking locked doors. So uh, there's two different ways to open it if you need to. Of course, they have to study. The cleric has to pray. The fighter needs to, to practice. The thief needs to do what a thief does. So that's that's all I'm really going to go into today because we're going into about 20 minutes and I try, I'm try i trying to keep these under 20 minutes is the idea that when you start to make an adventure Make sure it's not just geared to one class. Make sure every class is represented so that you can use it for multiple adventures or you can use it for different uh, uh, groups. That'll make the adventure more rounded and a little better. So uh, there you go. We have dice. We got basics. And uh, I was going to do it this week, but we'll wait till next week. Next week, we'll create a non-player character. And uh, don't forget, before you handle your, your collectibles, wash your hands. Good for your collectibles, most of all. Good for your health. And we'll see you next video. Bye.